This is the first of four slideshows on Greece. Here's the map of the area we're going to be looking at primarily, although you know, there's a little variance. But uh, this map indicates the three Aegean cultures, and they are in sequence Cyclotic and the Red Islands up here, the Minoan down here, and also up here, but the Mycenaean, this entire encircled area in the green. So just to get your bearings, um, we're going to start only with the Minoan. So uh, here's a view of the Aegean Sea to give you a sense of that beautiful blue sea and the geography of the land. This is the culture we're not really going to talk about. Uh, just I just want you to see what we're skipping over, and this is cyclotic culture, and that's because they're prehistoric. There's not a lot known about them, but a lot of people speculate. And you can see that the pieces that they've left us have a very modern, very stylized uh, appearance in their, in their human forms. But we're going to skip right ahead and go to the Minoan, so Minoan culture here. So the Minoan culture developed on Crete. Uh, the highest state of this culture was around 1900 to 1375 BCE. And just a generalization about the culture, it appears to be more interested in life than in the afterlife. And this is in very sharp contrast to Egyptian, which uh, we, is just kind of overwhelmingly obsessed with the afterlife. Um, so there's far more variety of media survives here than other places. So um, there are different periods. People who have studied Minoan culture uh, have the new palace and the old palace period, but well, I don't want you to be too concerned. So if you might come across those terms if you're looking at anything Minoan. Um, however, we're really going to focus on what's called the new, new palace period. So this is an aerial view of Knossos, the palace complex that was discovered by Arthur Evans and labeled Minoan. Um, we don't know what they called themselves, but the archaeologist who discovered them called them Minoan. And this is because he's basing that label on Greek mythology. And I'll show you what I mean there. So here's the palace up here. Um, for your dive into Greece, it would be advantageous, though certainly not required, if you have some familiarity with uh, Greek myths. So one of the stories of Greek myths was of the Minotaur. And the Minotaur was this half-man, half-bull creature who lived in a labyrinth in the palace of King Minos. And there you get the name. So King Minos and his labyrinth uh, inspired Arthur Evans to name this civilization the Minoans. So here's a reconstruction of the palace. I'm going to just jump forward for a second. We'll come back to this one. So here's a plan of the palace, and this represents more of what Arthur Evans would have found when he was digging here. And so you can see this, this maze of walls and passageways and very few through passages. So you could see how somebody could get lost and stuck in there. So to him, this just resonated with the mythology of King Minos and the Labyrinth. Now I'm going back, so let's look at this. This is what has been conjectured by uh, archaeologists, by scholars, to be a, a, a possible reconstruction of those ruins that I just showed you, the plan of. And it looks like a huge, to our eyes, I think it looks very modern, uh, an urban center with lots of connected buildings with passageways connecting them. It looks almost like a resort on the sea, a seaside resort. All that's missing is the pools and beaches, of course. Um, but a couple of things I want to point out. One is that everything needed in life is part of this um, this grouping. So there's 
living spaces, there's business spaces, there's whatever served as their worship space, not entirely sure there. So everything for life is in this one area. And outside of this would be nature, would be uh, their farming, their fishing activities. Then another thing, very important that I want to point out, I want you to look around the perimeter of this, that means the very outer edge, and there's no fortification. There's no way to repel an attack from an enemy. So these people, so you can see right here, this open kind of uh, a porch-like area, just it's completely open to the outside. So when I said it looks like a resort, it totally does. People could just stroll out, stroll in at their leisure. So there's no sense of fear of an enemy. So as if we just have to judge by the appearances of this site, we would say that the Minoans lived in peace and they had no fear of attack. Maybe a little fear would have been healthy, but anyway, that's what we see. So there again is the plan of the ruins and the labyrinth of Mina, of the Minoan palace at Knossos. And on the left, something that was preserved in those ruins is the stairway and these columns, which are really typical Minoan columns. Notice how they've been painted. They have no base to them, and they taper downwards, but they have this sort of cushion capital at the top. So that's um, what we're seeing in Minoan ruins. Another thing about Minoan culture that we see is a love of beauty, a love of uh, visual delight that they seem to like to paint their walls. And there's a lot of wall paintings that have survived. And they paint their walls in a way that just seems to take delight in the form and color. <clears throat> so um, this one shows some fanciful hills I like to think of this room as kind of a Seussian room. It looks, the hills look like something Dr. Seuss might have invented because they don't really look like real hills. I mean, look at this overhang. And then they're divided into bands of color, so blue, red, and yellow, with flowers springing out of these little tufts of foliage and birds flying in the air. So um, that's fun. Here's a reconstruction of one of the rooms that was found at Knossos, and it was labeled by Arthur Evans to be a throne room because there was a chair that seemed to be unique and have some uh, significance there. So he called this the throne room. Um, and there's also paintings on these walls. I hope you can see those. They're very colorful paintings. Another reconstruction of a room at Knossos is this room um, with a fresco over on the left of dolphins. I'll show you the actual remains of that in a second. But just want to point out this sort of the scale and uh, the elaborateness of the decoration in this reconstruction. Now here is the actual fresco that survives, the dolphin fresco. And this shows not only a love of painting, but a love of sea creatures because they, you know, it's an island. They're, of course, they're near the sea and fishing and sea life is, is part of their culture. So they chose to decorate this room with that. So the dolphins dominate, but they're not the only fish on the wall. I'm sorry, I know they're not a fish, um, but they have lots of little fish here. So um, that's fun. They like the beauty of the seat life, apparently. Here is a painting from another island. Now, this is not from Crete. This is not from Knossos. This is in uh, Akrotiri. So that's an interesting story about that island. Uh, if we had lots of time, I would love to go deeper into what was happening in Akrotiri. Anyway, this is a painting of a human, a woman picking saffron out of one of those Susian looking hills and I want you to notice the way she's been depicted every time we see an interesting human in the culture we're going to stop and pause and um, to see how that culture is representing one of their own.
So she's shown in profile. Um, she's got a ponytail. Either she's wearing a blue cap or her head has been shaved, but her skull is very deep blue. It looks like she has on makeup, I couldn't tell, hoop earring. Her clothing is a short sleeve, tight fitting bodice that is open in the front. You can't see her breasts there, but they would have been exposed. And her skirt is a long tiered skirt, uh, meaning that there are bands of different colors going down. Notice also she's wearing several bracelets, even one uh, around her elbow. So uh, she's your contemporary, really, in Minoan culture. And where she is in context is here. So she was part of this bigger wall at Akrotiri, and there's another woman with her uh, facing us frontally and showing the open bodice, although not a lot of details of the breasts there. So one of the most famous of all of the surviving paintings from Minoan culture is this uh, so-called bull leaping fresco. And it's, it's interesting for so many reasons. So notice what's in here. There's a bull in the center and then there are two humans on either side and another human in the center. So we're going to read this. We're going to see what we can gather about it. We're going to start with the bull because the form of the bull to me is one of beauty and grace. I mean, he's just comprised of several elegant curves. Um, this long, beautiful curve along his back that is echoed in the curve of his tail. And then his belly has this gentle curve and tiny little delicate feet flying up in the air. So the bull is airborne. None of his feet are on the ground. And what a lovely creature. Now we have to look at what the humans are doing. Oh, so much has been written about this. You would not believe it. But we're just going to observe. We're going to make a guess and we're not going to make any declarations. So first of all, we have two genders represented, and they're using the same convention that I showed you in one of the last Egyptian slides, and that is that women are depicted with lighter color skin and men with darker. So the humans at either end are women, are female, and the figure in the center is a male. So uh, what they're doing is a matter of speculation, but what I think makes a good explanation is that they are doing this stunt where one by one, a person will come up and grab the horns of the bull, flip themselves over the bull, and then land down here and be caught by this catcher who stands at the back. Don't try this at home. I think this has got to be uh, a very dangerous thing. Now, I, th I think that is a reasonable explanation for what they're doing. Why they're doing it, I'm not even going to speculate. Could it be an entertainment? Could it be a religious rite with some sort of significance of the bull and his strength and power? Yeah, it could be. Could this just be an imaginary scene and nobody ever actually did that? That could be also. So there you go. Um, you can figure it out for yourselves. You might also note the stylization of the bodies because I think that they don't really look very naturalistic. In fact, the proportions of the woman on the right, for example, resemble more a Barbie doll where she has very long, very long legs and sort of um, emphasized thigh, uh, but a very narrow waist and a swelling out again in the breast area, tiny little arms. Um, anyway, there you go. It's not naturalistic art, but it is certainly interesting. Another Minoan piece that reflects that same aesthetic from the dolphin fresco room and that is the octopus flask so it's just a water jug and it's been covered with the painting detailed painting of an octopus wrapping his tentacles all around the, the flask 
So it's pretty amazing. But uh, so, so far I've shown you no representations of any military action. There's been no soldiers, there's been no show of power, of uh, defense or offense. Just pointing it out as we are getting near the end of Minoan art. Um, this is a very rare and very beautiful ornament that shows the level of sophistication of their craft workshops. It's an, um, the woman, uh, the, oh, sorry, the Minoan bee pendant uh, is gold. It is worked gold with granulation and filigree. Those are just terms that indicate the, the way that the gold has been worked. It appears to maybe have been a piece of jewelry. There's a hoop up here that could have suspended it from a chain or cord. And uh, we have two bees here. Each or each of them is reaching for this precious golden nugget foot covered with gold filigree in the center. Notice how their tails meet and their wings fly out to the side. But then we have these three dangly pieces here just for decoration. They would have caught the light. They would have moved as the person, of the, as the wearer moved. And up here in this little golden cage is a golden ball that would have given a little jingle as the person walked around. So it's delightful. Um, very cool. Now that's it for Minoan art, and I hope you got the big idea of Minoans, and that is that they lived in peace, as far as we can tell. We see no obsession with funerary practice, although some burials have been found, some religious sites have been speculated about, but for the most part, they're very much into the here and now. So now we're going to shift and look at this other culture, the Mycenaeans. So the Mycenaean period is referred to as the Helotic period or the Bronze Age of mainland Greece. Um, <clears throat> Oops. There's a huge citadel complex in My Mycenaean culture that's over here in Mycenae, and we're going to really dwell on that. But a few other things about um, Mycenaean culture that these are the people of Greek legends. So when the Greek civilization really arises, and we'll see this very soon, uh, they have stories about the people in their past, and they love to tell those stories and elaborate on them and romanticize them. Among the most popular of those stories is the Trojan War, and that story occurs in the Mycenaean period. So when archaeologists are looking at Mycenaean ruins, they want to identify them with sites mentioned in the Iliad and the Odyssey. It's the stories of the Trojan War. Um, so well, we're going to move and look at something that we didn't see in Minoan art. I should also say that the Mycenaeans conquered the Minoans and took over their culture and removed some of their art from there into their own spaces. But um, I, I think we can distinguish them. So here is something we would not have seen in Knossos or the Minoan culture. And this is a dagger blade. A dagger blade with a battle scene that actually kind of reminds me of something we saw from Assyrian art where we have men fighting lions, showing their strength and their superiority over this beast. So you can see the lions on the right and the men with spears and shields going after the lions. So that's significant. Uh, it's not just a friendly little fish romping on a dagger. <laughs> And then the second thing is this was found in a grave, an elaborate grave, which the Mycenaeans made with grave goods. So that signifies a belief in an afterlife in which things from this earthly life are useful. So let's look at a grave now. Um, this is probably the most famous of all the graves. When it was discovered by the archaeologist Schliemann, who was working on Mycenae, 
he thought it was a treasury because it was full of great stuff, a lot of gold stuff. And uh, so he named it the treasury of Atreus because Atreus was somebody from Greek legends that he had read about. And so he thought, oh, this must belong to that awesome king, Atreus. But in actuality, it's not. It's just a very large tomb. It clearly belonged to somebody important, but we have no idea who. So there's a lot of uh, significant things about this tomb. First of all, it was a structure, a beehive that was constructed and then it was covered over with soil. So we always have to think about the construction and the sequence. It wasn't carved out of this, the earth, but it was constructed and then covered. So um, the, and I'm going to refer to it as the tree of Atreus just for convenience. Dates from 1300 to 1200 BCE. The passageway you see here that leads to it is 20 feet wide and 120 feet long. The door leading into the chamber is 18 feet high. <clears throat> that is so high. Um, and the door had been faced with bronze plaques and green marble columns. You can kind of see that in the reconstruction. The chamber is 47 and a half feet in diameter and 43 feet high, and it was corbelled with a capstone. Now here's another term, um, and it's up here. It mentions the Cyclops. When the Greeks, a few centuries later, found these places, they thought that they had been built by Cyclops, who were the legendary giants from their myths. And that is because the door was 18 feet tall, and the stones that constructed all of this were huge stones. And they just could not imagine how a little puny human being could have built anything with stones that big. So therefore, it must have been built by a giant, a Cyclops. Now, here's a view of the inside of it. So it's kind of a conical building, but the way it's constructed is, gives us a huge open space like we have not seen before, a huge covered open space, which was impossible in Egypt because the, the method of construction with stone in Egypt was just post and lintel, just um, having two side pieces in a a horizontal piece over the top, post and lintel. And as I discussed at the time, that's limited because of the weight of the stone. So uh, the Mycenaeans invented or developed or discovered this new, this new form of construction called corbelling. I feel like I'm going to sneeze. And here's the illustration of the two. Sorry, a sneeze is coming on, and I don't want to have to end <laughs> the slideshow. Um, so here on the left is post and lintel, what I was just describing to you, and this was what the Egyptians used. This is what all primitive cultures used. It's just simply resting a horizontal piece on top of two vertical side pieces. These are the posts, and the top part is called the lintel. And it's limited to what you can do with it because of the weight of the stone. But the Mycenaeans invented corbelling. So the way this works is the stones are tapered, forcing the shift of the weight off to the side. So the weight of this stone falls down on, oh, there we go again, falls down on this stone, <clears throat> on down until it gets over here. And then the weight shifts to this piles, this, these stones that have been piled up to make a wall and the weight goes down into the ground. So there's no, there's no pressure coming down on this opening, and this means that you can build up on top of this really high. So it's great. <clears throat> We're going to look here at the um, Fortress of Mycenae. So there were several graves in the grave circle down here, but that's not important. I want you to look at the big picture of this now and 
try to remember what the Palace of Knossos looked like, the Minoan Palace, how it was open on the outside. And this one is anything but open. It is completely fortified. Mycenae was built up on a hill, so it's got the natural defenses of the hill. And then they added to that by building this huge wall with a passageway on top of it. So you can see soldiers could move quickly around just on the walls. So if, uh, if they were over here and the enemy suddenly decided to attack from here, they could zip around there and get to that point. So it's built with defense in mind. Who were their enemies? Probably each other, other Mycenaean groups. <clears throat> so in this great fortress, there is only one opening, and that is right here, the Lion Gate. And we're going to look at that in a second. But notice how to get to the opening, anybody coming in must pass between these two uh, built-up places here, these structures that would have been filled with defending army shooting down arrows, throwing spears, throwing fireballs, whatever they could at any attack. So this is a sort of a brilliantly conceived uh, fortress. And then within that, you've got all the buildings. I'm going to show you um, a reconstruction of a Megaron up here. But first, we're going to look at that gate. This is the only opening in that entire fortress, and this is the way it looked when it was discovered um, by Schliemann and the archaeologists in, um, in when they first discovered it. I love this picture. That's why I love to show it. These men in their suits and their little hats. Um, but this shows the size of the gate. The gate itself is post and lintel. But all around the gate, we've got corbeling happening. Look at the size of the stone. So that is that cyclopean construction again, huge stones. Um, and the wall, I read somewhere that the wall had gone up for 50 feet above this. <clears throat> that means that there's a lot of weight, a lot of stone up there. And all of that, all of that weight would come down, would bear down, 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 and they get to this point and that weight would split and move over to one side or to the other side down into the ground. What happens with that is, let me go back to the diagram. Let's look at this one. Is that there's an opening above as the stones split. So, um, necessarily. It's also present on that diagram, this opening here. So it's not a good thing. You know, you'd want to be able to fill that up. So in the case of the lion gate, they plugged up the hole with a carving of two lions, two confronted lions with a column between them. Um, apparently their heads originally were lapis lazuli, that blue stone that we saw in ancient Near East. Um, so this is not structural. The lions are not structural. It's purely decorative. It's just filling the space and uh, serving as blockage to keep people from climbing in. Uh, the wall is corbeling. Okay, here's the way it looks today. So it's still standing. Uh, looks like somebody's done a little bit of repair work, but it's popular with tourists. There. The lions are still in place. Now in the palace at Mycenae, there was the, the ruins of a Megaron. So this is a reconstruction of what a Megaron was. It's one of the, the main forms of a living area within, uh, well, they were also common in Minoan, but this is common for this culture. So a Megaron, let's look at that. In the center of the Megaron, there's a fire pit, and there's an opening above the fire pit so that smoke can go up and go up into the sky. All around on the walls are paintings, so that's also similar to Minoan. The colors, the color palette, uh, even these patterns of decoration all remind me of the Minoans. The, there's a difference in the animals, though. These are... Um, these are terrestrial animals. They are not fish or sea life. So, that's a megaron. 
This is the end of our part one. There are three more parts, um, but now you have, I hope you've seen and gotten the big ideas of the Aegean cultures, the Minoan, the Mycenaean. The Minoans very peaceful, the Mycenaeans not so much. They're more um, inclined to be warriors and their house was very defensive. So stay tuned for part two.